morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Investors look ahead to a busy week of economic data, including the Fed's preferred gauge of U.S. inflation. Japan's top currency official warns against speculative moves in the FX markets. Commodities in focus as oil snaps a three-day losing streak, while iron ore holds its best weekly gain since September on increasing China optimism. Plus, Russia holds a day of mourning after the death toll from Friday's terrorist attack in Moscow reaches 137. France raises its security alert to its highest level following the attack claimed by Islamic State. And of course, we'll bring you the details on that Russia story as that continues to unfold. For now, though, we do have to check in on the markets, of course. Weekly gains for European stocks last week. Gains, of course, for US stocks as well. A bit of a muted finish on Friday. We do look ahead then to the Fed's preferred gauge on Friday. We're going to have Jay Powell and a speech as well on Friday in San Francisco. And here today in the UK, Catherine Mann, previously one of the Hawks, still one of the Hawks on the BOE, of course, the MPC, shifting, of course, her view around the need for an additional hike at the most recent meeting. She'll be giving a speech as well later today. So some central bankers in focus as well as we build up to that data print on Friday out of the US. Currently, you're looking at European futures flat. FTSE 100, meanwhile, currently at 7,952, down two tenths of a percent. S&P futures are flat as well. Little changed. As we look cross asset at the two-year yield, 459 is now the time to start adding steepness, giving what we heard from Jay Powell an emphasis, it seems teams on wanting to ensure there isn't more damage done, or at least damage done, full stop, to the U.S. labor market. Is that where the emphasis is now for the Federal Reserve? Are they shifting away from the focus on inflation to ensuring that there isn't significant cracks coming through for the labor market of the U.S.? The two-year at 4.59. The Japanese yen, of course, in focus for us today with the verbal intervention from Japanese officials around the currency. It seems like 152 could be the line that they're watching. Currently, 151 on the Japanese yen, just weaker by a tenth of a percent. Brent closing in on a third straight month of gains. The geopolitics are a factor. Goldman Sachs saying that the prospect of central bank cuts could also further support these commodity markets. $85.86 on Brent. Then iron ore, 108. That has quietly ground higher the prices on iron ore. After crossing through $100, you saw 8% gains in terms of prices for, of course, that key commodity input last week. A little bit more optimism around the demand picture out of China. 108 on iron ore. Staying with Asia, let's get more details on how the Asian markets are faring. With Avril Hong standing by in Singapore. Avril, what are you looking at? Yeah, Tom, we're looking at risk aversion this Monday as last week was pretty much those dovish signals from central banks that send stocks in the region higher. Today, it's a pullback as we wait for US data and Fed speak. The Japanese benchmarks are leading the declines. Last week, of course, it was a lot to do with the BOJ suggesting that it would still keep things accommodative. There was FOMO by traders in the market. There were investors that were betting that the Chinese or rather the Japanese economic revival would really help the equity space. So today there's profit taking in Japan and as the currency strengthens against the greenback, those export related counters are also sliding. Let's flip the ball, take a closer look at what we're seeing in China uh, because today we did get or rather over the weekend we got from the Chinese Premier Li Tiang talking about some of the property stimulus in a way saying there could be policy optimization to revive demand for the real estate sector. Uh, so that seems to be helping some of the sentiment in the equity space but note also how we're going to get some earnings scorecard from the property developers, Vanka as well as Country Garden, those could actually serve to underscore, highlight the weakness, the distress in the sector. Of course, the focus has really been about the renminbi and as we got the yuan fixed today, strongest versus estimates since November, the signal from the Chinese central bank seemed to be they were not comfortable with the weakness in the renminbi from last Friday and that is sending the offshore and onshore yuan closer towards that 720 level. But let's take a closer look, flip the board at the yuan spreads because that seems to be signaling what traders uh, see as the possible direction for the yuan. If you take a look at how the offshore yuan versus uh, the onshore yuan is at that cheapest in more than a year, that seems to indicate that 
they see further renminbi weakness. Let's take a closer look at the Japanese currency as we've been seeing it weaken last week to roughly that 152 level. Uh, that drew that verbal intervention from the top currency official, the most robust comments in the past couple of months. So that's helping the yen strengthen towards 151. But note here, we are also going into a period where there are many markets that are going to be on holiday. Liquidity is expected to be light. And Tokyo CPI as well as Tankan data is due. It could mean that we need to see more from Japanese officials to get ahead of things. That's what we're looking at for Asia for now, Tom. Okay, 151.21 on Japanese yen, US dollar. Avril Hong, thank you very much indeed, joining us out of Singapore. Turning now to the US, where Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic now says he projects this one interest rate cut this year, and that could happen later in the year than he previously expected. Before last week, Bostic had said it would be appropriate for the Fed to cut rates twice this year, likely beginning in the summer. Let's get more on that from Paul Dobbs on Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets. Is Rafael Bostic then out in the cold? Because it sounds like Jay Powell has become increasingly dovish. When we step back from a big week from these central banks, Paul, what, what is your takeaway with where things stand first and foremost with the Fed? Yeah, good morning, Tom. And I think, you know, the Bostic comments have to be taken in the context of he's still talking about cuts this year. Yes, he might be talking about later mm. in the year start, start date. He might be talking about slower pace overall. But, you know, it, he's giving away that kind of Fed mentality that they're still minded to cut when and if the data allows it. And I think that that's what the market is hearing loud and clear here. Uh, that they have a central bank that's still minded to cut. And as long as the economy looks pretty good, uh, people aren't that worried if it means we may have to wait a li little bit longer to get there. So um, in that kind of a context, you know, the fact that Bostic hasn't gone harder and said, well, maybe no cuts at all for the whole of this year. The market seems pretty happy to tolerate that, particularly given that we didn't see any big changes for this year overall in the dot plot. Yes, you know, kind of like a slightly tighter outlook overall, uh, longer term. Uh, but the market is still looking for interest rates to come lower and hearing that loud and clear from the Fed, and not least from Powell, as you mentioned, who's even switched the focus a little bit to talk about jobs data. And if the labor market starts to weaken, that gives the Fed another caveat to move, right? So that's still pushing in that same direction towards lower rates at some point on the horizon. Hmm. And how, Paul, how are traders then? How are the markets interpreting more broadly the messages that we got from, from the central banks, not just the Fed, but also, of course, the BOE, the ECB, the SMB with that surprise cut? Is, is the take that the doves are now at the helm, are in control at these central banks? Yeah, it feels like the SMB has uh, fired that starting gun for the rest of the, the, the developed markets uh, around the world, with the exception of Japan, uh, to begin with those rate cuts. And again, that's that same mentality, uh, same noise that the uh, traders are hearing and tuning into. And so that's why you see, as you mentioned at the top of the show, a lot of traders looking towards steepener trades, people betting on lower short-term interest rates relative to the long-term interest rates. Maybe we can finally... Uh, undo that inversing <laughs> yield curve that we've seen for so long. On the flip side of which, the caveat is that the market has been betting on this and been wrong several times already this year. I think Deutsche Bank counted oh. them up and said, you know, seven times market has tried. So it's a bit of a stop clock trade in the idea that we'll be right eventually. But again, we're back on with uh, having a go at that. And I think if you look across broader markets, the readout is this is still a very encouraging and supportive backdrop. We have the move index of bond market volatility sliding. We have credit spreads incredibly tight and still going tighter. And we have the exuberance that we're seeing in the equities market as well. So everybody's still happy with that longer term outlook. The central banks are heading towards easing or, or even on the way uh, or underway with the, with the Swiss central bank. And, uh, and there's reasons to be cheerful and optimistic as a result. OK, excellent wrap there of the market adjustments to the central banks. Executive editor for Asia Markets, Paul Dobson, thank you very much indeed. Now to what unfolded, of course, over the weekend in Moscow. Four men have appeared in court charged with carrying out a terrorist attack at a Moscow concert hall in which at least 137 people were killed. Bloomberg's Tony Halpin joins us now. Tony, Islamic State then saying that it carried out the attack, but Russia insists Ukraine was at least in some way involved. Talk us through the way that the Kremlin has reacted to this. Yes, uh, good morning, Tom. Well, I mean, in any normally functioning government, you'd expect heads to be rolling and serious questions to be asked of security officials about how this came to happen. 
Uh, instead, Putin has focused uh, his comments so far in attempting to point the finger at Ukraine and cast what happened in Moscow on Friday night as somehow linked to Ukraine and the war that Russia is conducting there. Uh, he hasn't made any mention of Islamic State, even though Islamic State have publicly declared that they are the ones responsible. They've published videos uh, showing uh, elements of the attack taking place. And US uh, authorities themselves have also said that Islamic State is solely responsible. So there's a clear divergence here in the messaging from the Kremlin. And uh, so far, we haven't seen uh, a change in that messaging, even though four men have been detained in custody and are from Tajikistan and don't, mm. on the face of it, appear to have any connections to Ukraine. Is, this, is, it, is it your assessment, Tony, that this is a Kremlin that's taken its eye off the ball of, of the ISIS threat uh, to, to, to Russia? And if so, is there a risk to Putin uh, and his government on the back of this? Well, um, the US did say that it, uh, it did issue a warning earlier this month and did say that it passed on details of what it knew to uh, Russian authorities. And Putin very publicly dismissed that uh, in a meeting with FSB officials uh, a few days before the attack. Um, it doesn't signify, I think, in any way that Putin's leadership is under threat. He has a very firm grip on power. The Kremlin's just engineered uh, another six years for him at last week's presidential election. But it does, I think, feed into a degree of cynicism among Moscovites in particular that the Russian state really wasn't paying attention to the threat because it was focused on things like repressing internal dissent and prosecuting the war in Ukraine. And for Muscovites, this is a really sober moment because they haven't seen anything on this scale since 2002. And there's been no real large-scale terrorist attack in Moscow since 2010. So it's bringing back some very dark mm. memories for Russians. And so far, at least, they don't yet have answers from the Kremlin. Yeah, and you, you've written about that uh, in, in great detail and, and really worth reading on the Bloomberg and on the terminal as well in terms of the context of what this means for the people of Russia. But as we look to Ukraine and these, what many would argue, are spurious links that Putin is making, trying to make to, to Ukraine from, from this attack. If you're sitting in Ukraine, then what should you be worried about? Is, is, is Russia preparing some kind of uh, retaliation, even as, even as many would, would say that it's, it's, it's ludicrous to think that Ukraine had any role in this? Yes, I mean, Ukraine's President Zelensky and, and, and other officials there have made very clear that they think this is some false flag operation by the Kremlin. They've said repeatedly that they have had nothing to do with this and they are not in any way linked. And it's certainly the case that Russia, since the presidential election, has stepped up bombing attacks on Ukraine and does appear to be intensifying uh, strikes on targets like uh, energy infrastructure. Um, so that does, in many ways, uh, make people worry in Ukraine that Russia is intent on stepping up the war now that Putin has another term and that this tragedy will be used in some way to justify and whip up public support for just so, such a course of action. OK, Bloomberg's Tony Halpin with the context around, of course, the tragic events that unfolded in uh, the outskirts, of course, the outskirts of Moscow with that terrorist attack and what that could mean domestically and internationally. Tony, thank you very much indeed. Now, France has raised its own security alert level to its highest in the wake of that Moscow attack. The French Prime Minister says the decision is justified given that Islamic State has claimed responsibility. It allows for more armed patrols in public places and comes ahead of the Olympic and Paralympic Games in the summer. OK, here's what else to be thinking about. Other things that are on the agenda then through this week. On Wednesday, the Riksbank over in Sweden, of course, will come through with their policy decision. Very consequential when you think about the real estate, the property market of Sweden that we know has been under pressure as well. So that's on Wednesday. Friday, as we mentioned, it is the personal consumption expenditures index that comes out. That data, we know it's the preferred data of the Fed in terms of getting a gauge on inflation. And the expectations are that that February number will come in higher once again, suggesting that the landing to 2% is not yet there. Also, we're going to be hearing from the Fed's Jay Powell as well speaking. It's a market holiday on Friday in the US, but Jay Powell is going to be speaking at a San Francisco Fed event. So we'll be listening out for that as well, whether he doubles down on what was seen as relatively dovish comments, of course, from last week. And this week, China's mega banks are going to be reporting. Also, Country Garden, of course, one of the biggest and most troubled real estate companies 
in China as well, coming out with earnings as well. So those two data points will be interesting in terms of rounding out the picture when it comes to China's economy. We've been hearing from the Premier Li Chang saying things aren't quite as bad as maybe some would suggest. Coming up, US Vice President Kamala Harris declines to rule out consequences for Israel, for Israel, if it invades Rafa. More on that warning next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has declined to rule out consequences for Israel if it invades the southern Gaza city of Rafa. More than one million people are sheltering in the area. We've been very clear that um, it would be a mistake to move into Rafa with any type of military operation. A mistake, but would there be consequences if he does move forward? Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. Okay, for more analysis, Bloomberg's Dubai Bureau Chief Dana Kresh joins us. Dana, an Israeli delegation uh, is, is in Washington this week to talk about Rafa. Uh, given what we've been hearing from the vice president, is Israel finally going to listen? Well, the U.S. vice president there is certainly upping the, re the rhetoric and raising stakes for Israel. That seems to be very adamant on going ahead with the Rafah operation. Um, Blinken last week made a surprise stop in Tel Aviv during his uh, short trip in the Middle East to yet again convey the U.S. message that that's been solid for the past week, that it is a mistake and it risks a high civilian casualties, um, compounding a very bad humanitarian situation and further isolating Israel in the region and in the world as well. So Israel hasn't listened so far to any of the U.S. demands. U.S. is asking for more restraint, more humanitarian aid, and has actually have been pushing Israel to sit down and talk about a post-war Gaza. Nothing of that has happened. And like you were saying, an Israel delegation is in the U.S. to discuss a alternatives to the invasion of Rafah. But to be honest, it's hard to see what kind of alternative Israel would be convinced of um, and not to go ahead with that plan. And, and you talk about the isolation of Israel, and it's hard to think of, of another country that is supporting Israel's objectives in, in Rafah. There is a lot of opposition to this from the EU, from Arab nations, and of course now from the US. So why is Israel so intent on this Rafah operation? Indeed, um, there is a lot of growing pressure on Israel not to go ahead with that operation. And of course, it could perhaps jeopardize what the U.S. has also been pushing for, and that's, you know, a historic normalization deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel and both Saudi Arabia and the recent Arab allies like Egypt and the UAE have been against that. But Israel says this is where Hamas's last bastions are. And their ultimate goal is, of course, to destroy the group. And that's what they want to do. Netanyahu says that not going ahead with the Rafah operation would risk another October 7 attack. And that's still very much alive in the, in the minds of many Israelis in Tel Aviv. Um, and that that another attack, he won't allow it. He says that the majority of Israel as, uh, Israelis are on his side. But we did see Blinken meeting in person with protesters who have been calling for the government in Tel Aviv to agree on a ceasefire agreement. So the U.S. is trying to do everything it can. And we saw this mm. U.N. Security Council resolution last week, um, although it didn't go through, but it is the, a way for the U.S. to say we have leverage to pressure Israel and we can use that. Um, but of course, it remains to, sit, to, to, to be seen how far the U.S. can take that. OK, Dana Kresh, thank you very much indeed, Dubai Bureau Chief, on the implications of those words from the U.S. Vice President. And again, as Israeli officials meet with some of their U.S. counterparts. Thank you. Coming up, Senegal's election cliffhanger. As officials wrap up counting the race to succeed, President Macky Sall is too close to call. That conversation is next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Let's turn our sights now to the latest on Senegal's hotly contested presidential election. The race to succeed President Macky Sall is currently too close to call as officials wrap up counting. For more on this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ondero Onganga, who joins us from Johannesburg. Ondero, why has then this election been so significant for the investor community? Mm -hmm. A couple of things, Tom. One, um, Senegal is very important for Eurobond investors because at 13% of GDP, they hold Africa's second highest stock of outstanding Eurobonds. Senegal also secured a $1.5 billion package from the IMF, which comes with parameters such as fiscal consolidation, like removal of energy subsidies. And this is dependent on who takes power and what policies they decide they want to continue. A couple of other things also in the pipeline. This year, Senegal has started to become an oil and gas producer, nine billion on the line. So this is some of the reasons why this election is very important. It will also determine whether political volatility will continue or peace and stability will reign like it always has in Senegal. OK, the commodity story, really fascinating, given, as you say, that they become an oil and gas producer. What were the key choices then for, for electors in, in this vote, Ondero? Two leading contenders here. We have Amadou Ba, who promises continuity of policies from the administration of President Macky Sall. And then we have Basir Faye, who's a firebrand backed by Usman Sonko. And he's very anti-government and anti-regime, and he wants to change a couple of things, one of them being moving away from the CFF rank and introducing a new currency. There are ups and downs to this. The advantages of having the CFA is that there's low inflation and the currency is very um, stable. However, on the downside, because the monetary policies are sourced from the European Central Bank, then Senegal has to overcompensate with a fiscal policy. So Senegalese people showed up in large numbers, voted. Counting is currently underway. The opposition is leading, but we wait to see Will they be able to clinch the 50% majority mm. of this vote? Ondero, what is the current state of the Senegalese economy and what is the appetite for overseas investors to participate in that commodity story? Senegal is one of the few African countries that are doing well. This year, they're projected to grow at about 8.8%. And like I mentioned, they're throwing themselves out there into the commodity market. We've seen a lot of interest. This project's a big project, $9 billion. They also have favor in the international market because of the peace and stability. Remember, Senegal is located in the West African region where there have been nearly eight military coups in the last three years. But this is a country that offers stability. Under President Macky Sall, the economy was growing at about 5% every year, and they've heavily invested in agriculture and infrastructure. So this is a country that investors look mm. at and they see good prospects. Really fantastic contest. Ondero Aganga, thank you very much indeed on that Senegalese vote and the importance of it domestically, but more broadly as well. Looking ahead to some rate decisions out of African central banks this week. Really important week in terms of some of those central bank decisions. Africa's biggest economy is set to diverge from their emerging market peers, at least in Latin America and Europe, as they maintain tight policy, tight monetary policies to contend with persistent inflation. Today, Ghana's central bank meets. Tomorrow, it's the turn of Nigeria. And on Wednesday, the South African Reserve Bank as well. So a number of big central bank decisions across that continent to be thinking about, given the different context around the inflation story. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Investors look ahead to a busy week of economic data, including the Fed's preferred gauge of U.S. inflation. Japan's top currency official warns against speculative moves in the FX markets. Commodities in focus as oil snaps a three-day losing streak, while iron ore holds its best weekly gain since September on increasing China optimism. Plus, Russia holds a day of mourning after the death toll from Friday's terrorist attack in Moscow reaches 137. France raises its security alert to its highest level following the attack claimed 
by Islamic State. Let's check in on these markets then. And across Asia, you've seen some downside pressure, most notably on the Nikkei, given the verbal intervention by officials in Japan, warning against further weakness in the Japanese currency, seeming to eye a line of 152. We'll check in on the Japanese yen shortly, but European futures pointing off by about a tenth of a percent. The FTSE 100 currently down by two tenths of a percent. S&P futures down by two tenths of a percent at 5,284. And the Nasdaq futures, after some solid gains that came through on Friday for the Nasdaq, helped by the likes of Alphabet and NVIDIA once again, currently pointing low by two tenths of a percent. But don't forget, the context is that the S&P and European stocks notched fresh record highs last week. Let's flip the board and look cross-asset then. The Japanese yen firmly in focus for the reasons that we stated. That verbal intervention, will the Japanese have to do more to put a line under the sand when it comes to the weakness that they've been seeing in the Japanese currency? 151, current down a tenth of a percent versus uh, the US dollar. In fact, up a tenth of a percent versus the US dollar. Uh, 151.24 on the Japanese yen. 4.59 at the front end on the two-year move desk of one basis point on the two-year after money moved into, of course, US U.S. debt, U.S. Treasuries towards the end of the last week on the back of the Fed's decision and the commentary from Jay Powell. $85 a barrel on Brent, setting itself up oil for a third straight month of gains, up five-tenths of a percent. Iron ore, as we said in the headlines, also pushing higher, 107 after gains of 8% in the week last week, currently down two-tenths of a percent. Let's check in then on what has been unfolding, get the context, the analysis around, of course, the tragic events, the terrorist attack in the Moscow suburbs, the outskirts of Moscow on Friday. President Putin is continuing to insist that Ukraine was involved in the deadly Moscow concert hall attack, despite Islamic State claiming responsibility. I'm joined now by Matthew Sussex, a visiting fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. First of all, your take on where you think this leaves the Russian president. Is this a Kremlin that took its eye off the ball when it comes to the Islamic State risk? Well, yes, I think so. Um, it seems that the um, the FSB and, uh, and, and Russia's security services, particularly the Interior, Interior Ministry, um, have been so focused on looking at you know, internal dissent uh, following the, uh, the death of Alexei Navalny uh, and uh, and also, you know, very busy looking at the war in Ukraine, uh, that they have uh, have missed what seems to be uh, an ISIS attack, which they in fact were warned about by the United States uh, as early as March the seventh. Uh, but Putin responded that this was an at attempt to intimidate Russia and to meddle in its internal affairs. And to be clear, it seems there is very, very little evidence. Putin is saying there was some window that was opened by the Ukrainians. Are you, are you saying, is, is that in any way credible that the Ukrainians could have played any role whatsoever? Look, I don't think it's uh, is at all credible for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there's a very active front line uh, with people shooting at one another. So getting across would be, would be very, very difficult. Uh, second of all, of course, uh, ISIS has uh, not only claimed responsibility, uh, but released video of, of body cam uh, footage that was was filmed really, really gruesome stuff uh, during the attack. Um, and, and, and ultimately, um, you have to ask what would Ukraine possibly have to gain for either teaming up with ISIS or making uh, selecting people from Tajikistan who looked as though they were from mm. ISIS? How would you expect then Putin to use this to his cynical advantage in the days, weeks and months ahead? Well, look, in terms of Ukraine, uh, it will, uh, he, will, he will use it to justify further violence. It's the way that hey, he has responded to, uh, to similar types of attacks in the past uh, and, uh, and weaponized them. Uh, in terms of uh, internal uh, control, I, I suspect he will probably want to clamp down on Russia's regions, uh, notably uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, the Chechen leader, uh, has uh, has voiced some disquiet over some of the claims made about Muslims in Russia uh, in the aftermath of the attack. And also there's a potential, of course, that he could use this uh, as a justification for further rounds of mobilization of people to send them to the front line in Ukraine. Talk to us a little bit more about that mobilisation question then, because that, that is something that seems to be 
a, poten a potential option. There, there, there have been some commentary from some senior, senior military officials in, in Russia, it seems, kind of edging towards that, pushing, pushing for, for that need. How, re how realistic do you think that is? Do you think the Russian president is closer uh, to another mobilisation of, of his people to ensure that they have the manpower to push their objectives, at least in Ukraine? Well, given the, the losses that the Russian armed forces have suffered, you'd have to think that it's a po distinct possibility. And uh, the Russians invaded with about you know, 360,000 troops, of whom it's estimated 315,000 have been killed or, or wounded, uh, prompting these, these two sort of formal rounds of mobilisation, which gets the numbers back up to about 450,000 in Ukraine at the moment, uh, but also they're losing people at a, at a really advanced rate, so they need to replace that somehow. And I'm not sure that the sort of stealthy crypto mobilization that, that Russia's been engaged in, for instance, saying that all Cossacks can be called up for service, I'm not sure that that's going to make up the numbers. And what's your current assessment of, of Russia's uh, progress, if that's what we call it, in, in Ukraine. How vulnerable are the Ukrainian front lines at this point? How, how desperate is the need for ammunition? What, what is your assessment of how things are unfolding on the ground in Ukraine? Well, I think it's absolutely crucial that Ukraine uh, receives the, uh, particularly the artillery ammunition, but also drones um, and air defences that, uh, that it desperately needs, that are currently, of course, the majority of, of funding for that being held up uh, in the U.S. Congress, but it will come to pass. I think that that uh, the U that the European Union will be producing enough artillery ammunition to help Ukraine by the end of the year. But there is a sort of long lead time of about ten months or so before that becomes a reality. So the Russian progress has been slow, um, incremental, uh, and of course they're facing the same obstacles that the Ukrainians faced when they launched their counteroffensive. Uh, last year, which was, of course, uh, a large network of, of tank traps and, uh, and minefields. OK, Matthew Sussex from the Australian National University with that expertise when it comes to defence and security on the events that have unfolded, of course, in Moscow and the implications. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Goldman Sachs says commodities are set to advance this year as central banks lower interest rates. The analysts reckon that copper, aluminium and oil will see the best returns as industrial and consumer demand improve. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Clara Fiera Marquez then for the details on this. Clara, do you agree with what, with what Goldman is saying? Does that align with what others have been saying about, about the potential upside for commodities this year? You're right. I mean, it really is their feeding into quite a bullish mood in commodity markets the past few weeks, really. Uh, we've seen Macquarie come up. We've seen Carlyle Group, which, of course, is now Jeff Curry, used to be um, at Goldman, really coming out this idea that as rates come down, that will stimulate demand, with the U.S. doing well, China perhaps doing less badly than people might have expected, economies like India really picking up. There's, there are tailwinds for commodity markets, so we should be looking at a strong 2024. I would point out, though, that Goldman is, is specifically identifying a handful of commodities. They're yeah. saying investors will have to be picky. So they're looking at copper, they're looking at gold, they're looking at aluminium, they're looking at oil products. So I think that is quite important. This is not a tie that will lift every single boat. OK, what other commodities should, should we be keeping uh, an eye on then? I mean, we were talking, of course, about the geopolitics in the last segment. Uh, there's been a focus, of course, on, on Russian refineries. They've come under attack from, from Ukrainian uh, drones. There, it seems to be some evidence that U.S. sanctions on Russian oil is starting to have more of an impact. But, but maybe beyond oil, what other commodities are potentially looking to move in the months ahead? Uh, well, it's, as you know, a very wide-ranging, very different group of, of, of asset class. Well, it's a very diverse asset class. You're looking at oil. Yes, you're mm. right. The, the uh, drone attacks on Russian refineries are really tightening oil products. Uh, we are, you know, in general, it's actually a pretty tight market, and we are seeing quite strong demand. If you look at the comments that came out of Sarah Week last week in Houston, they really were quite bullish for oil. 
Elsewhere, I would really point people towards copper. Have a look at that. It's really, you know, we're heading towards 11-month highs, copper at 9,000, and that's still quite modest if you think of where copper needs to be in order to really change the supply picture. We'd have to probably be north of 11,000, and that's an, um, something that people have been waiting for for quite some time. Is this the tailwind that will push it over? Probably not yet, but there are certainly some uh, good reasons to be a bit more optimistic there. OK, Clara Ferreira Marquez, thank you very much indeed on the Goldman call around the further upside that could come through for at least some parts of these commodities market. Uh, Clara, thank you very much indeed for the context. Now, the yen and the yuan are strengthening after authorities moved to counter last week's weakness. Let's check in uh, on the Asian markets, or at least the perspective from Ven Ram in terms of these FX moves and more, uh, and more centrally as well, what is happening in terms of how the markets are repositioning around what seems like this dovish tilt for most of the major central banks. Ven Ram joining us from, from Dubai. Ven, let's start with the question of the Japanese yen then, the verbal intervention. Maybe it's 152 that the Japanese officials are looking at in terms of a line in the sand for the currency. What, what do you make of what we've been hearing from these Japanese authorities? And do you, do you expect that verbal intervention to have to be matched at some point by real intervention? Morning, Tom. I think that we are still a bit further away from intervention. I think uh, a physical intervention in the markets because I think verbal intervention is easy. It doesn't cost nothing. Words are cheap. But when it comes oh. to physical intervention, the costs are punitive and you have to put up millions of dollars up front to even move the needle on FX markets because USDJPY is one of the most traded uh, currencies crosses and to move the needle on the dollar yen takes a lot. Um, so I think that the uh, Japanese are concerned. It's not uh, surprising that they are concerned, but I think that any intervention will probably come around 155 and even then it, won't be, it will be symbolic rather than try to turn the tide. In terms of the yen, I mean, there is no question that the yen has moved away from fundamentals. So Masato Kondo is right when he's saying that the yen has diverged from fundamentals. And, um, uh, but unfortunately, it's a random walk in the markets, FX markets, as it, to happen, as it often happens. And that is what we are clearly seeing now. But I think the tide will eventually turn because, as I said, the yen is fundamentally misaligned with where it ought to be trading. OK, so the yen is, is fundamentally uh, misaligned, so agreeing there uh, with what we've been hearing from the key FX official uh, out of Tokyo, Ven Ram. In terms of your views on, there's another, you know, top red story in the Bloomberg right now. We've seen this before, haven't we? What, seven times? Seven times in the most recent cycle? The Bombles, the Bombles are back. They're favouring steepness. W would, you would you align with that view? Would you align with that trade, Ven? I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that the front end is going to be bid because, you know, obviously the central banks have shown their bias, whether it's the Fed, the BCB, the BOE, they all want to cut rates. So I do see the exuberance for the front end, but I think a steepener of a different kind is going to work here, which is the best steepener, because we are not yet at that stage when they are going to cut rates imminently, even though they want to be cutting rates. And in the meanwhile, they seem to be tolerating higher inflation. They are not really saying 2% inflation anymore. And even in the uh, case of the Fed, that's true. So if that is going to be the case, a best steepener would work better in that kind of environment. And I think in the short term, before the Fed starts cutting rates, I think best steepener rather than a bull steepener may uh, come to the fore. OK, the bear steepener versus the bull. There's the call then from Ven Ram of our m &I team. Always excellent on these markets. Ven, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, could New York State start seizing Donald Trump's assets. Yeah, we're going to pivot to talk about that looming deadline for the former president. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, later today, Donald Trump faces a moment of truth for his finances. It is the deadline for the former president to post a bond of more than half a billion, more than half a billion dollars in a civil fraud case bought by New York's attorney 
General, who better then to unpack the details of this story than Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta? Of course, a crucial election year for the U.S. with the vote coming through in November. Kriti, what are the details? What do we know at this point? Well, look, about a year ago, he was actually indicted on the criminal charges in New York. Now, it looks like, to your point, the finances are coming to haunt him. Look, it gets a little nerdy. Stick with me here. But this has everything to do with a civil fraud suit in the state of New York where he owes $454 million. To your point, how does he pay for it? Well, there's some legality here that suggests you can't just pay the $454 million. There is interest involved. You need collateral of about 100 to 120 percent of the bond value itself. That means he actually owes something close to something like $600 million. Now, Tom, even for a billionaire, that is a lot of money. And that's really where things get a little bit tricky because that deadline comes obviously today and it comes at a time when the companies, he calls them about 30 or so, that traditionally provide this kind of payment are saying that his collateral is not enough. Now, traditionally, real estate isn't used as collateral for this kind of bond payment because of all of the real estate risk that's actually involved with that. So kind of as a sure thing, they insist on cash. Now, $600 million, again, is a really a large amount to have stored in your piggy bank there. Uh, and that's kind of the, the point that he's taking, which is simply that on the one hand, he can't even afford to do this. He might actually uh, call for bankruptcy, although the question is, will hmm. the judge actually see through that and say, well, this is really a way to get out of your loan obligations. The other option is for to, to trigger some sort of fire sale, which all of a sudden creates an even more scrutiny into what his real estate and even his Mar-a-Lago estate, not to mention the kind of stakes that he has in New York commercial real estate, are actually worth. And Tom, you and I know he's famously... Uh, kind of in the dark about what that's actually worth. Yeah, so you're, t- you're talking some of his big brand properties then that could ultimately be, be on the table, pot- yeah. potentially. Uh, so not just as simple as, sell- as selling down some of those assets, or that's what it could come to? I mean, what, how, much, how much kind of financial peril does this ultimately lead him leave him in. He's been able to duck and dive a lot of this stuff. Does he duck and dive this one as well? Unclear. And both options seem a little a little scary here because to your point, some of these kind of famous assets, think of Trump Tower, for mm. example, on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. We don't know what these finances are worth. And he's already, the civil fraud suit has to do with asset valuation. So all of a sudden, you have even more scrutiny to what these properties are worth. On the other hand, is he able to get some sort of financing from a friend, get financing from a foreign government, for example, that instigates some campaign finance rules in terms of how much is this for a friend, how much of this is in support of potentially the future president of America. So your guess is as mm. good as mine, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Okay, Chrissy Gupta, thank you very much indeed. And the importance of the decision that comes through, we're expecting to come through potentially later today on that financial commitment from the former president, Donald Trump, and of course the nominee and the candidate for November. There is plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Initially, we had bottom-up drivers, secular themes that were very powerful. But that rally was narrowing. Now, suddenly, you have a very powerful top-down factor that has come in, enabling central banks that clearly are going to do what they want to do, regardless of selective data focus. Well, let's so talk these about two the things we can. These two things coming together are really powerful. Were you surprised by what came out of the news conference with Chairman Powell? I was surprised by the extent to which he stressed patience in two ways. Patience with inflation running higher. He basically dismissed the fact that we've had some pretty surprising, hotter than expected inflation prints. And then the second patience with the balance sheet, saying, you know what, we may get there slower than we would have otherwise, which means that monetary policy is going to be more expansionary than it would have been otherwise. So I was struck that on, on the balance sheet, he took such a big step forward when he could have waited till the next meeting to do that. So we keep wondering what shoe is going to drop, right? We keep thinking everyone's bullish and then more bullish and then bullish on top of bull. And you have to wonder, okay, well, when does something break? And we were talking on Wednesday, it's the inflation expectations, that at some point this is going to be a higher, more inflationary environment with a Fed that is less willing to fight it. And yet I'm not seeing it in break-even rates. I'm not seeing it in other places that you normally would. Why do you think that is? You're seeing it in gold. Look at the reaction of gold, record highs on gold. I think what you're having is, and and you've all said it really well, the the everything rally. So it's going everywhere. What's interesting now is this notion of market enthusiasm, not economic enthusiasm. There's a big difference. Market enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm could spread to the rest of the world. And that is quite a consequential statement. If that occurs, then the U.S. relative strength 
is going to be somewhat diminished. I think it's actually too early to pivot. I, I do think that, to use your phrase, U.S. exceptionalism, economic exceptionalism, isn't going to expand to the rest of the world. The U.S. is really exceptional when it comes to its economy. The others aren't doing what the U.S. is doing in terms of investing in the future drivers of growth. They don't have the entrepreneurial society that we have. They don't have the mobility of factors of production that we have. The U.S. is truly exceptional among ad other advanced economies. So do you think it's rational for people to stay in the United States and to keep adding more, even if valuations are at such high levels relative to the rest of the world, to continue to kind of bet on this ship and not expect it to expand elsewhere? So I've been asked that question every single year for the last five years. And every single year, the U.S. premium has increased. And every single year, I said, don't fade the U.S. too early. I see some argument for diversifying away from the U.S., purely on this enthusiasm and on, on relative valuation, but I don't see it as strong. It is not being supported by fundamentals. People have to realize this. This is more betting on the momentum. And I understand that. The momentum factor is very strong right now. Okay, that, of course, was Bloomberg Opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian on the U.S. exceptionalism and the momentum that he's seeing in these markets. But he started the conversation there talking about the fact that this is a Fed now that will look through these stickier inflation inputs. And that's what we're seeing as we look ahead, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index out Friday, so the next crucial data point. And does the Fed continue to look through that? Because the expectation is on a monthly basis, you get an increase headline of 0.4% for the February data from 0.3% on core as well. And this is what's happened. You take you back to the end of last year and you see the landing strip coming into view in terms of the inflation story for the US, but then the nose tips up again on the plane, it doesn't land, and it starts to tick up again. That is the story, the stickiness around the personal consumption expenditures index and the fact that it has now started to grind high in the last three months. And that February number on February on Friday is expected to build on that story. Now, when it comes to what is happening with the S&P, because you think about the inflation story, you think about the Fed reaction function, and then, of course, you tie that into the equity movements and the call from Goldman Sachs that actually it's keeping its base forecast in terms of where the S&P ends the year, 5,200. We've already broken through that, of course, but it has played out one scenario where mega cap tech moves back and leads to a further 15% gain for the S&P and setting itself up potentially for 6,000. One scenario, not the base case for Goldman Sachs, but worth thinking about. This is the valuation story, though. They say valuations aren't stretched. History, though, is a guide. Markets Today is next. This is Bloomberg.